we are uh, entering our last set of lightning talks and it would not be a lightning talk without any shenanigans. Uh, I'm Julie uh, and this is Medikin and David and we will be guiding uh, us all through our last day of, of, of fun. Uh, yeah. so, mm. um, I think we're... Are we ready to get started? Yeah. Why don't we get started? Um, very exciting. First up is going to be... Uh, It'll be Holly. Holly, Holly Helmbrecht, which is a great name. Also, yeah. I love names that have alliteration. And we're going to say goodbye to David. In Bye. Bye, David. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Holly. We're very excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Is it showing? Yep. Yes. Perfect. Can I just get started whenever then? Yes. Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, hi, my name is Holly. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington in the Elizabeth Nance Lab, and I'm giving my lightning talk on a Python package I've been developing called Fiverr, which is a framework for no image based experimental routines. Um, so when I began my PhD two years ago at the beautiful University of Washington, I was an academically trained chemical engineer with an undergraduate research background in medical diagnostics. I defined myself as a traditional wet lab researcher. And so when I got the opportunity to join the NANCE lab, I thought that I was going to continue using my chemical engineering training in order to develop tools that build upon my traditional wet lab knowledge. But when I found out that the University of Washington has such a strong e-science Institute and that they provide introductory coursework in software engineering and data science, I thought I might as well learn to code. What I didn't expect was that the more data science classes I took and the more I got to stare at these beautiful images of brain cells, the less time I was actually spending on the bench getting new images of brain cells in different diseases and the more time that I spent using data analysis in order to try and understand what the shapes of these cells are telling us about disease. So two years into my PhD, I shifted from a traditional wet lab researcher to what I now identify as a data scientist with a domain science background in traditional wet lab research, and specifically as one that studies cell morphology, and not the cell morphology that I was taught in elementary school where all cells are somehow this perfect circle, but the cell morphology of beautiful brain cells that are incredibly intricate with a ton of different shapes and whose functions and phenotypes and morphologies and branching can actually tell you whether a brain is inflamed or whether there's been disease or how it's reacting to treatment. But one downside of studying cell morphology is most of the time the shape information that we look at is quite limited. And just by looking at this microglia here, you can tell that there's way more features to explore and more than I've listed here. And that this is just a start. So when I thought, okay, how can I explore these features I stepped officially away from the bench and I decided that the best way to do this is through data science to get more insight into cell morphology. So we built our first pipeline. It's very simple. We took our images from an experiment. We calculated standard cell shape features. And we did some basic quantitative shape analysis. Our first iteration used Cell Profiler, which is an amazing software based in Python. And then our second iteration, we added in Vampire, a package from the Dennis Wirtz lab at Johns Hopkins, which allowed us to begin classifying our cells into representative phenotypes. And we liked this pipeline so much and the data that it gave us that we use this in a publication that's currently in press in order to understand cell response to oxygen glucose deprivation. And when we had a really good response and really good insight from that, we thought, why don't we go bigger? And so the first thing that we realized is that not only is this pipeline applicable to our immunofluorescence stains, but it's also applicable to a more generally used immunohistochemical stain. And not only does it work in rats, the species that the NANCE lab mainly works in, but it also works in ferrets and piglets, collaborations that we have running right now. But in order to do this, we needed to scale up. And so to scale up, we couldn't be using such a pointy clicky process that we were in this publication. So we developed Fiber, these frameworks, and we decided to wrap Fiber and do it completely in Python and Jupyter notebooks because 
because when we worked with our collaborators, that was something they were most comfortable with. And when working in Python, it allowed us to switch out cell profilers specifically for scikit image to study standard cell shape features, which actually allowed us to use our other package if thresholds for more control over thresholding and segmenting of our cells. But it additionally allows us to use SciPy in various ways in order to do our quantitative shape analysis and shape distributions in the same um, package rather than going to GraphPad Prism, which also is an open source. And so now we're currently exploring data visualization in the same spot in order to speed this up. But the biggest takeaway from this is that not only is this current pipeline useful for our trained data scientists, but when we um, think thoughtfully about fiber, when we actually put it into a package and host it on GitHub, and when we've designed Jupyter notebooks that are usable and we're planning on hosting them in Binder, this is not only applicable to us and our collaborators, but we're developing a new tool for studying cell morphology that can be shared with non-data science labs worldwide. Um, and so an acknowledgement for our team that's allowed me to make the switch from wet lab work into completely data science. And thank you to SciPy for letting me do my first lightning talk ever. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank Whoa, you. that was awesome. And you were so fast. <laughs> Under five minutes was the plan. Impressive. But so now I'd like to know, are there vampire piglets? <laughs> no, they're just normal piglets that we study with vampires. <laughs> Sadly, the blood not been drained by uh, supernatural beings. Mm. Um, up next is Eric Ma. That was a timer. <laughs> I thought my volume was not on. Cool. Uh, we have our first poll live, um, and it is, what is the best conference snack? Gummy berries, mini cans of Diet Coke, glitterati mints, or lima beans, we think? <laughs> So how glittery are glitterati mints is what I would like to know. It depends on how fresh they are. Ooh. Some you can chew right through and others crunch. <laughs> Sounds much better than Pop Rocks, which is like glitter in your mouth, I guess, kind of. Yeah. Eric, uh, I think you're, we can see your I'm, screen. So. I'm ready. Can you see my screen? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're good to go. Okay, okay. Yes. Let's go. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Eric. I work at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. I've done some statistics and deep learning. And today I want to talk about language. Uh, and in particular, this is something that's kind of troubled me for a little while uh, in that I see that language is really important. And it, if we don't do language correctly, it actually hinders or hampers the communication between fields. So. Um, let's talk a little bit, and by the way, this the thing about language is not Python versus R versus Julia versus JavaScript, it's something else. It's about the term inference. But to talk about inference, we have to talk about modeling in general. So here's my little rant. My rant goes like this. Every time we're concerned with modeling, generally speaking, the most general abstract way you can think about it is you got data, you have model, models are comprised of a structure and their parameters, and we make an output from, the, from data plus model, right? What I've heard really prevalently in the deep learning world and literature is they call this task, this task of predicting output given data and model inference. It's you hear it everywhere. At inference time, when we do inference on our, uh, when we, when we do inference at inference time, etc. cetera. But uh, if you think about it, yes, it is a form of inference, but if we want to encourage cross communication between two fields, statistics and deep learning and machine learning, it might be a little bit better to stick with one term. And so I'm gonna propose uh, a, a little modest proposal. That is, every time we talk about parameters that were unknown, and we're trying to learn what those parameters are, that's inference. That's this act over here, learning what parameters are uh, that we don't know. And every time we try to talk about the output, we're actually predicting what the output is conditioned on data and the model, right? So why I think this matters? This matters because 
That general modeling framework that I talked about above, it holds for stats, it holds for classical ML, and it holds for deep learning. Also, a common language that doesn't trip up people from different fields facilitates idea exchange. And I actually strongly believe that the deep learning, machine learning, classical machine learning, and statistics worlds all have great things to learn from one another. And so just as a common API, like, you know, use the NumPy API, don't, don't invent your own NumPy almost API. Just as having a common API enables interoperability, a common language facilitates idea exchange. So really, let's start calling prediction what prediction is, and let's call inference what inference is. With that, my rant is done. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Eric. I loved this rant. <laughs> that was a very modest proposal. All right. Such a <laughs> swift talk as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next. Huh? Oh, yes, yeah, some food. <laughs> that, yeah, it's like yeah, gummy bears <laughs> winning. Ooh, oh, gummy bears is winning. Okay, what was the poll again, Julie? Okay. Best conference snack. Oh, yes, best conference snack. Um, next up is Alice Harpole. Thank you, Eric, for the great lightning talk. I love the chalk talk. Definitely Thanks, not Alex. dry at all. All right, let's bring up Alice. Cool. Ooh, Alice. So we're going to also switch, switch our polls. Our Ooh, new poll, another poll. What is the best version control system? Git, SVN, HG, iterative file names, entropy? How, how do you Ooh. version control? Um, well, probably entropy, you know, just like divergent file naming. It's not iterative for sure. It's just like all different directions. <laughs> Definitely not a wonderland. Okay, sorry, Alice. Enjoy. You, you've got you've got the stage all you now. Okay, let me share my screen. Cool. Can you see that? Uh, yep. Yes. Great. Cool. Um, okay, so my name is Alice Harper. Um, I am a postdoc at Stony Brook University. And I'd like to talk to you about Pyro, a framework for hydrodynamics, explorations, and prototyping. Um, so this is a code that I work on at Stony Brook with Mike Singardi. Um, so first, what is Pyro? Um, so Pyro basically started off its life as a way of teaching students um, all about computational fluid dynamics. Um, so it's kind of a way to simply teach them how um, hydro simulations work. Um, and because of that, it means that the code itself is supplemented with a really extensive set of notes um, developed by Mike over the years, um, which are all up on GitHub um, and available for anyone to read. Um, and it's basically how I learned computational fluid dynamics during my um, grad years, so they are really great. Um, but over the years, we've kind of uh, discovered that Pyro is not just useful for students, but it's also really useful for us. Um, so the main stuff that we do at Sony Rook um, is we do kind of really um, high level simulations of fluid dynamics within stars. Um, so convection in stars, um, supernovae, white dwarf mergers. Um, these are all done in C++ and Fortran, um, which is really great if you want to do like a really, um, really accurate um, detailed simulation of a star. Um, but it's not very good if you want to just be able to rapidly prototype a new algorithm. Um, so we've actually found that Pyro is a really great, great way of doing that because Python is so much simpler to write than C++ and Fortran. And it also allows us to share our exploration in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so we can um, kind of explore a load of different parameters, present them all in a notebook, and then share that with our colleagues. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so here's a brief history of Pyro. So Pyro is actually like almost 20 years old now. Um, so when Mike first wrote it, um, it was all in Python, numeric, and C extensions. Uh, so fluid dynamics is quite computationally expensive. So if we did it all in Python, it would be very slow. So that's where the C extensions come in. Um, over the years, the numeric has then become numarray, then numpy. Um, and these C extensions have uh, gone from C to f2pi and number. Um, so basically in 2018, I came along um, and got rid of all of the Fortran and converted it to number. 
Um, and we found that the performance is basically the same. Um, and this actually is really good um, for students' perspective um, because it means if you're kind of a student, you may just be getting to grips with Python. So having to deal with Fortran as well is quite difficult. Um, and it's also a lot easier for them to install py Pyro on their computers because installing Fortran on a Windows computer is not so easy. Um, so we have a load of different solvers. Um, I won't go over all of them, um, but we've got like the standard compressible hydrodynamics, shadow water, incompressible um, ETC. Um, we have a website. So our website explains all of the different solvers in detail um, and has loads of examples on there. Um, and now I'm actually going to do a live demo. So we'll see if this works. So this is a notebook from our documentation. Um, so we can import Pyro um, and then set it up with the solver, the problem we want to run, and so on. We initialize our simulation. Um, at this point, we can print out all the properties. Um, and we can visualize it. So every single problem has its own vis routines, um, which are built with matplotlib. Um, you can see like that. Um, I can then evolve my simulation step by step, like so. So this is just an eviction problem. So I'm just moving this bubble. Um, it's not doing very much um, at the moment. But if I run the whole simulation, um, then you can see that it does nothing, but it has, in fact, looped all the way around. Um, cool. Um, I can look at different uh, variables individually and print them out to screen. So this is really good for debugging. Um, we actually have a nice pretty print, which doesn't look pretty at this resolution, but again, is really good for debugging. Um, and then just to show you a more complicated problem. So this is Kelvin Helmholtz. Um, so I like this one because it's very squirrely. Um, so if I scroll down, you can actually see it updating in live time. So on, we'll see if this runs quick enough. Um, there. And at the end, I can get my visualization of my lovely, pretty, squirrely Kelvin Helmholtz. Um, OK, so if you want to get involved with Pyro, you can clone it from our GitHub repo. Um, we have documentation all online, um, and we are always welcome to any PRs, any bug reports, any feature requests. Um, so if there's a solver you'd like to see, um, then just let us know, and we can help work with you to implement that. Um, cool. Thank you for listening. There were so many fireworks in that pyrotechnical talk. That talk was lit. <laughs> Excellent. Amazing. Oh, so good. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, up next is Chigozi. So in, in our current... Uh, I'm supposed to be quiet. Sorry. Now <laughs> you all know what your alarm is going to sound like. Get ready. <laughs> I tried to make it gentle sounding. Uh, best version control system looks like Git. Git is winning. Um, Git is winning, not entropy? It's not entropy. I don't understand. If you give it enough time, I'm sure it would win. <laughs> I think so. I was going to say, keeping with entropy, my computer definitely would have crashed during a live demo. So Alex uh, that, that's also really true. stunned us all. So now we're at best editor, V2. We have Notepad, Vim, Stone Tablet, not Emacs, or Gmail Compose. Ooh, I think this is going to be contentious. Obviously, VI and Vim are going to win after yesterday. So, okay, Chigozi, all you. Hi. Uh, so my name's Chigozi. Uh, and it's my first year at SciPy. Uh, I'm a scientific software developer at Mthought. Um, that, however, is not to say that uh, this talk, anything I'm going to present in it, any of the tools I'm using are used at Mthought or endorsed by Mthought because they're all nonsense. Um, so if you hang around in the same kind of circles that I do, uh, you might have seen this sentence before. Um, if you haven't seen it before, uh, then it might not seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, briefly, what it means is um, Buffalo, who uh, are from the town of Buffalo uh, and are buffaloed by other Buffalo from the town of Buffalo, themselves Buffalo other Buffalo from the town of Buffalo. Um, so that was pretty fast. Um, it might still not make a lot of sense. Um, if you want to understand it, I recommend not listening to this talk and instead uh, reading this book, uh, which is a nice illustrated version. And it's already also available uh, here. Um, I, however, can't draw anything. Uh, so um, 
you're not going to get an illustrated talk. However, um, I can uh, use NLTK. Uh, so here's a little context-free grammar uh, that um, that implements all of the uh, all of the possibilities. Um, and uh, let's try and pass that sentence. Um, so there you go. You're going to have to trust me that uh, this is a correct passing because I'm going to uh, swiftly move on uh, and talk about uh, register machines. Uh, so this is a register machine um, that uh, has two registers, uh, Little Buffalo and Big Buffalo. Uh, and in particular, it's um, a uh, Minsky uh, program machine. Uh, so it has three instructions, uh, jump if the register is zero, uh, decrement a register and increment a register. And so you might see where this is going. Uh, we're going to try and make a programming language that uh, consists entirely of Buffalo sentences. Uh, so how can we do this? Um, we've already got part of the way there uh, because uh, we've named the registers Buffalo and Buffalo. Um, We'll also say that um, each sentence is going to represent one line. Um, the first two sentences are uh, fairly easy. They're special. They represent the initial state of the registers. Uh, and it's not, as you might think, as simple as uh, just taking the binary representation and uh, going zero is lowercase b and uh, one is uppercase B, because that doesn't guarantee that you will have correct English. Um, so instead, what I've done is I've fixed some of the uh, tokens to be uh, particular ones and then made only certain ones variable. Um, you'll also, uh, if you uh, are very fast at uh, reading, you might notice that this register, which contains two, for some reason has a fours place. And that's just because um, I have made it so that you can um, place any number of trailing buffaloes at uh, trailing lowercase buffaloes at the end in order to make it a valid English sentence. Um, so after we have the initial uh, state, we uh, have the instructions. I'm going to speed through this, but uh, this is how they work. Um, and have I proved that every possible instruction will be valid English? No, I haven't because I can't really be bothered. Um, but I do have a proof by intimidation. I did check the first 10,000 possible Buffalo sentences. Uh, and um, as long as you have a significant, a, a sufficient number of trailing lowercase Buffaloes, it will be valid English. Um, so here's the program that we were trying to implement at the beginning. Uh, you'll notice that I um, have uh, escaped comments uh, with a Buffalo emoji, obviously. What else? Um, the style guide does strongly encourage that you don't use comments to uh, have any useful stuff about the state of the program uh, and rather just incidental asides. Um, so does it work? Uh, let's use the program to convert this to a program machine and run it. And yes, that was the initial uh, program, which just moves numbers from one register to another. Uh, because it is a Minsky register machine under the hood, it is Turing complete. And that's all. Um, there you go. That's my talk. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Also, uh, I'm very happy that you brought up Buffalo because that reminds me of cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to keep pushing cheese on everybody. So. Uh, Minsky machine. M-I-N-S-K-Y. Um, yes. Yes. And I also think uh, you might want to go back to the chat. There's some amazing uh, Buffalo okay. jokes that will you be. can, you know. I, I, I will I will make sure to uh, have a look at them. I didn't mean to go along with the herd, but it was, it was perfect. Um, next up is Ko. Quash, I think, is how you say your last name. Even you, you can make so many jokes. <laughs> yes, who knew? Oh, can you raise your hand or say something in the chat? Uh, so it looks like 
surprises me. <laughs> Vim is winning. Ha ha. Ha. See, it was the perfect poll yesterday. Okay, code just waved. Um. So Stone Tablet didn't win because turns out it didn't. Oh. Wow. And nobody wants to use Gmail Compose. I don't understand. So now, now our big poll question is: What year is it? Ooh. Hello. Welcome, Co. Hi, my first time here. I have nervous. Oh, it's amazing. Did you see the lightning talks on Monday? Don't be nervous. Yeah, don't be nervous. We're happy. Welcome. It's electric in here. <laughs> I saw my Pikachu running around. So. <laughs> that would be the perfect uh, thing if you go over time. We can make Pikachu noises. <laughs> Do you want to try and share your screen? Yep. Uh, screen. Oh. Oh, no, I have to restart. Oh. So, wanna... Yeah, why don't we do the next person? We'll bring Co back up after. Does that yeah. seem reasonable? Okay, yeah. next up is um, Niels. So, Niels, if you say hi in the chat, then, and I think you can um, kill Co's feed. So yeah, I know. think that. Surprise, Niels. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. Oh, can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Niels, and my lightning talk today is about building an auto ML system for a fun and nonprofit. Just a little background on myself. Uh, I have a background in biology and dance, and uh, I meandered my way through public health to eventually get to data science and machine learning. Um, so now I'm doing ML engineering at Talkspace and also uh, contribute various open source projects. Um, cool, so just get into the meat of things. Um, my talk is about yet another auto ML project. So I don't know, uh, yeah, this, this meme of like this uh, transcendence thing uh, seemed appropriate here for the six levels of auto ML. So at level zero, you're writing everything from scratch. Um, level one is like using the popular high level APIs like sklearn and Keras and things like that. And I, all the way at the bottom, you have like a Jarvis type thing where you're just like chatting with something and then it's like model this thing and then it builds a model for you and does some magic. <laughs> Um, I don't know who has a level five system right now. Um, yeah, it'll be a while. So why am I doing this? <laughs> so it seems like everyone has an auto ML system from open source to uh, enterprise level systems. And I guess they kind of traverse the various levels of auto ML. Um, but yeah, the main reasons I did this is, uh, as the title suggests, for fun. I also was curious about what it go what goes into building such a system, and also there were like some techniques that I read about at my in my spare time that I kind of wanted to learn more about and possibly combine it to something that works. So the thing that I've this project I've been working on for like on and off for the past year or two is basically a meta reinforcement learning based auto ML system. Uh, I think most systems today use Bayesian optimization for hyperparameter optimization. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to see if it was possible to combine techniques from uh, meta learning, which is learning to learn, deep reinforcement learning, and applying that to automated supervised learning. Um, yeah, so a, a benefit of this is that if you have a distribution of data sets and tasks associated with those data sets, you can basically sample the data sets and then sample the, the, those data sets um, to produce like, you know, an infinite number of, of episodes or tasks. Um, so as a refresher, this is the reinforcement learning API where you have an agent 
that perform certain actions in the environment. And the environment is like this generator of rewards and states. So the way this maps onto this particular problem is um, I'm using PyTorch as the agent or controller. And this is a neural net that ge basically generates a sequence of actions that um, is interpreted as a machine learning pipeline in sklearn, like an sklearn pipeline with you know feature preprocessing and the estimator at the end. Um, the environment is a task distribution, basically a, like a suite of data sets. And the state generated by the environment at each time step is a set of meta features like how many examples are in the data set or how many categorical variables are there and so on. And the reward is the validation performance um, based on some metric of choice. So uh, I'll just flash this in front of you. Uh, basically, the architecture is that there's a um, recurrent module that takes in the state, their previous reward, and the previous actions, and um, produces some hidden representation that then is the input to this cache controller Sorry, cache is this um, combined algorithm selection and hyperparameter op optimization. So this is the thing that like generates hyperparameters and selects algorithms from the sklearn API. And does it learn? Uh, this, these are like super preliminary. One way you can look at this is so um, that's like how much worse were your actions compared to like the optimal thing you could do. Uh, on the right is the mean validation score um, for a particular episode on the x-axis. And the blue line here is learning rate of zero, which is basically like the randomly initialized neural net just like flailing about. And um, some tuning here for the learning rate, and it seems like a 0 0.005, like doesn't do as well in the beginning, but then it kind of like learns how to do stuff in these randomly sampled data sets. And um, yeah, does it meta learn? So I trained this on binary tasks, binary data sets, and then tested them on multi-class data sets and regression. And it, uh, I don't know if yeah people can really interpret these really well. It's kind of small, but these are cumulative rewards over n shots over the the frozen frozen weights of the, the neural net. Um, and my time is short. There's a bunch of stuff that I could possibly do with this, and. Uh, it's in super alpha. There are no docs or anything, but I would like to this is where we can find the project. Thanks. Thank you. We certainly learned a lot in that. Um, and so we're going to bring Ko back now. Yes, thank you for that, Niels. Also, I'd like to say um, that our previous speaker is also a first time presenter. So, um, and I can't imagine anything better than Buffalo and a first time talk. So, I am back. Sorry. Oh, no. No, it's all okay. We're Can ready. I this just means we have like more anticipation, you know, and we got to learn about learning while we were Especially waiting. Especially this in the year of the Linux desktop. Ooh, it won. It won. Excellent. Also, by popular demand, the best cheese. <gasps> yeah, our polls. Ah, I'm so excited. Oh, okay. This is going to be excellent. Okay. You have the uh, floor, Co. Okay, uh, so hi, my name is Ko. I'm a grad student from Vanderbilt University, and today I'm going to present uh, about a project that we have has been working on for the last few years. It's called MOSDEF, or Molecular Simulation Design Framework. So this work is a collaboration between our lab from the MAMS, the Multiscale Modeling and Simulations, and Software Scientists from ISIS, so uh, it's Institute for Software Integrated System. Um, so let's see, what is MOSDEF? So uh, actually before we go into what the project itself, I want to talk about the motivation behind MOSDEF and uh, what issue we're trying to solve. So in the world of molecular simulations, there are a lot of simulation engines, so uh, just simulation code libraries. But the problem is that each of them use a different file format and uh, different potential forms and even different units. So that causes a lot of issue with the interoperability and re reproducibility in the molecular simulation like research. So for example, if you create one system, specifically what, uh, for a one simulation engine, you cannot use that for a, another. So uh, that's what 
most steps before. So let's create. Uh, so most step is a software suite that aims to assist and facilitate the initialization of chemical system for molecular simulation. So the initialization step can be broken into three steps that's handled by a different library inside most step. So the first one's constructing chemical systems that's uh, handled by mbuild, a molecular builder, and next is the agent typing and parameterizing uh, by Fourier. And lastly, storing type structure and writing out the design format that can be read by uh, different engine, co uh, engine codes, that's called GMSO. So next, let's move on to the components of most step. So the first one's Ambil is our uh, molecular builder. So the Ambil library is responsible for constructing chemical systems. So represent, representing chemical system as a Python data structure actually enables better reproducibility and large scale screening because this provides people with an easier way to interact with the system and it's easier to swap in in and out like components and to create new system. So the main data structure of Ambil is compound this is a hierarchical structure and can be used to present everything. So literally from a particle, a bit, or a residue, which is a collection of particles, or a molecules, which is a collection of residues, and so on. Which uh, the hierarchical can, structure can be represented like on the uh, graph here. So with that design, you can actually create a very complicated structure, just like stacking particles together, and just like putting Lego together. You can end up with any system you can imagine with. I mean, it can be a little lower, but yeah, you can do it. Um, so if, if, if like user don't want to um, do it like the, um, <clears throat> like putting particles together, they have the option to create compounds by loading from various file formats. So we support PDB, Monto, XYZ, and like other like common file formats. And also we can load from a smile screen, which is a 2D representation of a chemical structure. Like the examples is here. I mean, the code is very simple. It's just one to line to create and then visualize it. And next, after the system is created, we need to uh, agent type it. So the agent type is the process of labeling particles according to its chemical context. So as you see here in the example, we have a CF4 and a methane. And we see that even though the center particles are both carbon, they are different just because the neighbor is different, the environment is different. So the process of labeling will tell us like these gonna have like different labels, have different parameters. And um, the Fourier package is a library that can automatically uh, do the agent time and parameterize. And we actually employ network X under the hood to do on the, um, the the plotting and, uh, and matching and make sure that our uh, um, labeling is correct and accurate. And last but not least is uh, the GMSO package, which stands for General Molecular Solution Object. This is the new structure to represent parameterized chemical topology in Fourier. So as we mentioned earlier, the goals of most step is to improve the reproducibility of the field. So that is reflected in the goal of GMSO. So what we do is that we try to know to make no assumption about the system, which means that we're gonna store everything explicitly. This means we're gonna store a variety of potential functions of a system as a simple expression. We're gonna store all the units of the uh, parameters in the system by unit package, and we're gonna try to have a lot of writers support like as many engines in the community as possible. And if you want to learn more about uh, Mostia, please visit, please visit our website at mostia.org and uh, also check out my poster. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ko. That was excellent. Um, I uh, think it was most deaf cool. Uh -huh. Next up, we have Artash. Artash, can you raise your hand? Or just like comment in the chat. I need to control my phone. Um, also, did somebody say, okay, so emergency. <gasps> Look at those props. This, this, this is how you know I'm actually in Austin. You are actually in Austin. Now I'm getting some major sci-fi FOMO. Next year, we'll have a queso fountain. We will have a queso fountain, and we'll have a lightning talk about creating the queso fountain. It'll be great. And we'll have another one about the viscosity of oh, uh, um, Eric says, um, Vika says Artash. So it says, hey, it's Artash. It's like a couple up. Yeah, I think it should have 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a really close poll. It seems like y'all y'all are a big fan of cheddar, uh, but now this one's going away. Um, Wait, what, what one? I didn't see the cheddar. Result. It was cheddar. Oh, cheddar one. Cheddar mm-hmm. one. Very cheesy. Um, keeping the spirit of cheese. Our, our next one is and Austin is our is that <gasps> breakfast tacos. Uh, breakfast and you know what? In best next, breakfast. somebody did say breakfast tacos earlier. I there think James did. So, chaos room. Mm. Um, Artash is another first timer, um, and very excitingly, he may be the youngest uh, lightning talk speaker we've had to date. As we connect, um, and he'll be giving a talk that we think will be out of this world. Ooh, excellent! Because it's about exoplanets. I was going to ask if it was on Jupiter. Oh, <laughs> that's that's an, an Indo planet, I think. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, um, my knowledge is not astronomical. Um, is it just queuing it's accepted and connecting Mm. it might be asking you about permissions or something Nardash like sometimes it's like there's like a slight delay for me yeah and and make sure you're in chrome Uh, yeah make sure you're in chrome uh, <laughs> which feels not good to say as someone who works at Mozilla. Don't worry. We'll make sure to like advertise your um, Chrome support at this conference. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Show it to my boss. That'd be great. Mm, yes. Oh, Haman, that's like an amazing, is having an oh. existential crisis. Thank you. That was beautiful. Really cancel invite. Okay. We're gonna we'll try to invite again. I mean, really, is there is this a lightning talk without shenanigans? No. <laughs> Seems like he's gonna be a star presenter. Oh good. Gil Gil also feels pain. The chrome pain. Yeah. Chroming pains. Ooh, yes. I can just make air horn noises for everybody. Na, 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 lightning talks. Um, <laughs> Our touch range is USB C. Yeah, the the best part about this is that there we haven't had connection cable issues. Yes, there's no true. there's no need for Mac Mac dongles. Um, but this means I can't like sneak up behind the lightning talk speakers and try and unplug them as they're. I could make you talk. big. Ooh, yes, I'm ready. I'll do some sweet dance moves. Um, I'm, how, why don't we um, move on to the next speaker and then Artash, like when you come back, like ping him up the chat again. Um, yeah, or... yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so our next um, person on deck is Chris Barker. So Chris, if you say something in the chat. It's good that Chris is a really unique name and it's easy to find. Yeah, I have never met a Chris before in my life. Could just like go by a single name like Madonna. Okay. Thank just you. above Eric. Yes. All right. Okay, looks like it worked. Whoa, welcome. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Chris Barker. I've been going to SciPy for a lot of years, so I really miss the heat of Austin right now, being in gray, dreary Seattle right now. Um, uh, but And actually, I wasn't planning on mentioning this, but as it happens, I was a theater arts major at Oberlin College, so we've got a bit of a thread going here for new careers. Um, so how do I share my screen? 
You hover over your um, video and then there should oh, be like okay. a share screen option. Yes, the infinite screen. Oh, this is what we all need. There. You can see the depths of the yes. All right, got it now? Yes. Okay. We see you. Um, so this little talk was actually born as an answer to a question on a mailing list where we had someone kind of new to Python that was a scientist and was trying to figure out how the heck to manage their little collection of code. So I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. Uh, this is up on GitHub pages and there's a little bitly link to it here if you want to go look at it again. Um, <clears throat> So the too long didn't read here is if you've got a little collection of your own code you want to access, you want to make a package out of it. That way you can put it in one place, use it in other places. And most notably, you do not need to put it on PyPy. Uh, so a lot of scientists and engineers find uh, that they're doing a little bit of coding. They've got a collection of their own little scripts and utility functions they want to use for various projects. And they're trying to figure out how to sort of handle that. So there's a few options. So you can keep all your code in one place and then copy and paste the functions you need into each new project. But don't do that, really. It is not a good idea to copy and paste code around. You're going to end up with so many different versions scattered all over the place. It's a big mess. I mean, we'll regret it. Another option is put your code in a single directory and then add that to Python path environment variable. So don't do that either. Uh, the problem is that Python path is shared by all installs of Python. And what with Python 2, which is almost gone, but some of us still have to deal with it, Python 3, virtual environments, con environments, that's really not a way to manage it. Uh, if you don't believe me, go Google it, and you'll find a lot of people explaining what a disaster it is. So what you want to do is make a package. Um, Python has this really nice packaging mechanism, uh, which allows you to have a collection of modules and scripts uh, that you can then use from within Python. And the issue here, though, is we usually think of this as something carefully developed for a particular purpose and distributed to a wide audience for reuse, the kind of things you can install with PIP. And a lot of these are being talked about in these lightning talks. And that is the case, but this collection of modules and scripts part can be used for your own card that no one else is ever going to touch or look at. And the overhead is very small if you use it just that way. Um, so why do a lot of people not figure this out for themselves? And, and I think the reason for that is that the packaging documentation that you find on the net is very focused on how to make a proper package so that you can distribute it to a wide audience. Um, and so people find this documentation and they either think, I, I don't need to do all that. And so then they move on and continue copying and pasting their code around like they already did. Or they go ahead and follow all those instructions, and then they end up putting their tiny little package up on PyPy because that's sort of the final step in the process, even though there's no reason to do that. Um, so I'm just going to tell you right now that making a simple package for your own use, very simple, very useful. Um, so the step-by-step -step here, and I'm going to run through this live hopefully in a second, is you just have to create a directory. You want to put your code in. Um, side note, this all code is going to be in one directory, which means you can also put it in version control like Git, which is another fabulous thing to do. Um, so once you've got your directory for code, usually you create another directory inside that by the same name. It doesn't have to be the same name, but that's a convention that is generally used. You want to be a little thoughtful about what you name your personal package because you want it to be easy to type, you want to remember it, but you also don't want it to be the same as some package you're going to download from PyPy um, and have name conflicts. So think about that a little bit. So in the directory you're going to create your code, you put a file there called dunderinit.py. Um, and there doesn't have to be anything in that file. It just has to be a file with that name. And then outside of your code directory, you need a file called setup.py, which describes how your package is set up. Um, so in the end, you'll have a little directory structure that looks like this. My code inside it, another my code with a dunderinit.py, setup.py outside of it, and then one or more actual Python files with code in them. Um, so this my code directory is a package. And just the fact that it has that dunder init.py file in it makes it a package as far as Python is concerned. Um, and then the setup.py file is how you specify how it's all set up. Um, 
If you want to learn all the details of all the wonderful and fabulous things you can and should do with setup.py uh, for distributing packages, uh, go read this and many other fabulous tutorials on the internet. But for now, the simplest thing we can do, and it's right there, you have to use the setup tools package, you import setup, and then you call setup giving a name and tell it where your code actually is, packages, and that's it. And if you have that, you now have a package that you can install and use on your Python. Um, and I actually, in fact, wrote a little script that you can download from here that will actually build that empty package for you. I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, and then once you've got this package, you can put some code in there. Uh, so here's a little example of a little bit of code that has a function in it. You can have any number of functions you want. Um, and the real key issue now, though, is if you want to use this package, you have to install it into the Python environment you want to use it in. Uh, some of us just have a single Python and I'll uh, wrap this up real quick. Um, or if you have virtual environments, whatever, you want to install it. Each one, you do this with pip install, switch E, and so let's do it. I'm running. Oh, yep. no. And there we go. Hooray. <laughs> you, did you did it. We all did it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. That was great. That's and we're going to try and bring up Artash. Um, so Artash, if you comment again in the chat. And I think Chris will have to, um, yep, there we go. Thank you so much, Chris Parker. That was great. Is it working? Yay, Hooray! Welcome. So Hi. yes, we believe that Artash is one of our youngest Lightning Talk speakers ever. Um, I'm just thinking you're part of the student program. Is that right, Artash? Yes, I am a student. Excellent. Great student. Great eight. Okay, so uh, welcome. The screen is yours. If you hover over, you should see a sh um, share a screen option. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Artash, and I'm a grade eight student from Toronto, Canada. And I've been working on projects related to space exploration, robotics, and using big data sets and AI for several years now. And today in my lightning talk, I'm going to be talking to you briefly about one of my most recent and interesting projects on removing the noise caused by stellar spots from exoplanetary observations using a hybrid machine learning model. Now, before I get more into it, I'm gonna show you a short one minute video explaining you the problem in of my project. So Artaj, I don't think we can see your screen yet. How do we detect exoplanets? Let us assume that my face is a star and this is an exoplanet. When the exoplanet passes in front of me, some part of my face would be blocked off. So if I was a star, my brightness would decrease. Let's say we have a new exoplanet here. And this one, as you can see, has an atmosphere around it. So if this exoplanet passes in front of a star, the decrease in brightness would be slightly more. Stellar spots add noise to the data by changing the depth of the light curves. I used a machine learning model to reduce the noise to accurately measure the radius of the exoplanets in different wavelengths. I plotted the mean squared error of the model's prediction over these 40 iterations. In conclusion, my model was effective in removing the noise caused by stellar spots. This is because it reached a mean squared error of 0.001. All right, uh, so that was my video. And you can see in the video, I've built a machine learning model to remove the effect of the stellar spots so that I can accurately predict the, ex the exoplanet atmosphere composition. Now, in fact, this task was previously done by humans, but now as the influx of data coming from space telescopes increasing, we need to develop more algorithms such as this one to process space data. Now, to share uh, the, how this project with others, I've created a GitHub repo so that everyone can follow the steps and create a machine learning model to solve this problem. 
So once again, I'm going to share my screen and walk you through my GitHub. All right. So my GitHub username is rtashn, and I'm just opening this in Jupyter Notebooks. All right. So this is the entire tutorial, and there are a couple of different steps. So the first step is the tools that I've used for this project. And this includes NumPy and SciPy for processing of our data set, um, as well as TensorFlow and Keras to code our neural network. So first, it walks you to the how to visualize and download and pre-process this data set, such as normalizing it. Then it walks you through visual visualization of the different parts of the data sets to get a good idea of what machine learning algorithm to use. The second step is finding a good machine learning model that you can use to process this data set. And uh, a quick note, in fact, this data set is a simulated data set from the TESS, so the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, sorry, not from the test, from the Aerial Space Telescope, which is going to be launched in 2028. So I even walked through the different types of neural networks that exist. And finally, I demonstrate a possible solution to this network. And this is a hybrid network because it takes in two different kind of information types. So this means that instead of just taking a, in a sequence or just taking it, taking in a picture, I take in multiple types of data from our exoplanets. Finally, we train the model and I show how you can make your own custom neural network to solve this problem. So you can try out this um, tutorial. I'm just gonna post the link in the chat. And um, in, for my future projects, I plan on working with data from the test data, test space telescope, which has been launched last year. And um, it's been really fun so far. And if anyone has any suggestions or tools I could use, or if anyone has worked on test data before, uh, please reach out to me. I would love uh, to hear about what you've done and learn from you. My email is artash.nac at gmail.com if you would like to contact me. And I think you posted in the um, Slack also, right? So people could contact you there, right, yeah. Artash? Yeah. Yes. Are you going to be participating in the sprints at all, Artash? Um, perhaps, uh, because there's definitely a lot um, of things I can learn from the SciPy community. Um, the tutorials are amazing, and I perhaps would join a sprint. Okay, well, we hope to see you there. And I think, um, you know, you gave a great talk today. Thank you so much. And you really have made, I think this is a record of our youngest Lightning Talk speaker. So um, you can make some good contributions at the sprints. I'm sure we would all love to see you there. Um, thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, participating in the Lightning Talks today. We're over time. I'm really sorry to both uh, Matt Beckert and Philip Rudiger, who were our kind of uncertainty schroding our spots today um maybe we can uh see your talks another time or something maybe next year uh we uh collapsed the wave function in a way that uh was a little bit long but um <laughs> <laughs> thank Perfect. you everyone that was a stellar talk yeah uh, definitely the, artash that was uh great I'm such a stargazer. I love it. Yeah. Amazing. Um, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for Lightning Talks. We know that these ones were um, different, but we're very grateful for your patience and all, all of the punnery that happened in chat. Um, yeah. And yeah. Nice, nice work uh, with the pun chat. And next year, definitely going to have Queso Fountain and Cheese Your Own Adventure. Yes. So get ready. Okay. Yeah. Now we have a whole year to create a choose your own adventure, which is going to be great. It's true. Amazing. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, um, thanks. And then yeah. join join us in Zoom um, shortly. Uh, if you go to the announcements Slack channel, I believe it's yeah. in where all of the different Zoom calls in, and I am yes. going. Yeah. We'll see you Bye, all there. Uh, party. Have a good sci-fi, everyone. Thank you.